This is Andrew Stotts of A. Stotts Investment Research to talk about the valuation model for Mega Life Sciences Public Company Limited. Before we get started, let's go through the disclaimer. Remember, this example was created on the 12th of December, 2016. What follows is not a valuation, forecast, rating, or recommendation. Rather, it is a teaching example. After all, I'm a teacher. What follows is not investment advice either. Rather, it's a teaching example. It is intended only as academic information to those who want to learn about valuation. It should not be construed as the basis for any valuation or investment. The information in this presentation came from various sources which we believe are reliable, though we do not guarantee the accuracy, adequacy, or completeness of such information. We hope you enjoy learning about valuation as much as we do, and I do. So let's get into it. First of all, Mega Life Sciences is a manufacturer and distributor of pharmaceutical, nutritional supplements, and fast-moving consumer goods. It has a presence in 31 com- countries and has manufacturing facilities located in Thailand and Australia. The company is also a leading distributor in Myanmar, Vietnam, and Cambodia. Cambodia. Mega We Care is its own brand of nutri- nutritional supplements, prescription pharmaceutical products, and OTC products. It distributes products under the Max Care brand covering prescription pharmaceuticals, over the counter drugs, and other consumer products. The company also operates as an OEM for various products, including health supplements, pharmaceuticals, herbal remedies, and vitamins. Let's look at the revenue breakdown by segment. Mega Wheat Care was 49%, Max Care was 45%, and OEM 6%. If we look at the revenue by geography as of 2015, we can see that Myanmar was 35%, Vietnam 17, Thailand 19, Cambodia 7, and others 22. So first, let's go through and look at the company's situation. And here I give the output of a forecast. Now in this forecast, we can see that this is a made-up forecast, made up by me, and what we can see is the net profit growth numbers, let's assume, are right here. And we can see actual numbers, 696, then it goes to 700, 956, and 955. Of course, creating the actual forecast, because this is an example, uh, would take a lot more effort where we'd go into each of the revenue breakdowns by country and by product. We can look at the simplified balance sheet here, assets, liabilities, and equities, and see that actually if we look at the equity, uh, the the revenue growth, we can see about 3% was last year, 2015, then 8, 10, and 13. These are assumptions based upon nothing really except just using them for a teaching example. Now we can see the growth in EPS was 27%, then down to almost 0, then 22, and then 11.5. And assets have been falling. We can see so far in 2016, they've fallen. So let's assume that they're about minus 1% growth. From these assumptions, we can see an output here that shows the gross margin assumption is about flat, operating margin about flat, but improving a little bit in the next couple of years. And then we see net margin improving in the next couple of years. We see the same exact trend going on with ROE and ROIC. So now let's move on to how do you come up with an absolute valuation? Well, we start with the cost of equity. Now in Thailand, let's assume a cost of equity of about 10%. Uh, Let's say uh, in this case, we are assuming a cost of equity, in fact, for mega of 10% and a cost of debt of about 4% during the discrete period and a cost of debt at about 5%. Now, of course, getting to this 10%, has to do with the risk-free rate and the equity premium and all that. But for right now, let's keep it simple and just show about a 10% cost of equity discount. Now, the capital structure in this company is 95% equity. And what we can see is that uh, the weighted, therefore, most of the capital is coming from equity. So 95% weight times a 10% cost of equity gives about 9.9 in weighted cost of equity and a tiny little amount from debt. So that works out to a weighted average cost of capital of about 10.1 during the discrete period and also about 10.1, we keep it, let's say we'll keep it the same in the non-discrete or terminal period. And then a long-term growth rate of 3%, 
After that, we can see some of the uh, outputs of that. First of all is the present value of the cash flows in the years during the discrete period. And whether we're looking at a dividend discount model, or a free cash flow model, or a free cash flow to equity model, we can see various uh, levels of that. And then the terminal value, which we can see in the dividend discount model, comes out to about 5, 8, 9, 7. In the free cash flow model, is much bigger, and free cash flow to equity, much bigger. So almost all of the, uh, the value of the company for the free cash flow models are coming from the terminal periods. If we add these two up and then we add cash and other long-term investments because we are measuring free cash flow, when we measure free cash flow, we're looking at operating cash flow, then we can come up with the corporate value for the business. And after that, we take away debt and we can come up with the shareholder value of the business. Look at the number of shares and we can come up with a wide swing in valuation from a DDM valuation of 8.7, free cash flow to the firm of 25.2, and free cash flow to equity of 20.2. Which one's right? Well, that's the art of valuation, and that would require a lot more thinking, but at least this gives you a framework or an idea. Now, let's look at P.E. to growth, uh, and in this case, we can see that Mega's P.E. ratio based upon, let's say, 2016 estimate numbers is 29.3. That compares to the healthcare industry in Thailand at about 40 times. And if we look at the EPS growth of Mega in 2016, it's about 14.7, and it's about the same for healthcare, about 13.7. Now, the healthcare industry in Thailand has very highly profitable uh, hospitals and very generally fast-growing, steady hospital business, and therefore, they tend to be ranked at a higher P.E. ratio. So we can see on the P.E. to growth uh, chart right here that the overall PEG ratio, right, is really high for Thailand and we can see that lower is better for a peg ratio so it's cheaper on a PE basis though it's not exactly the same as a lot of the companies in the healthcare industry we may want to compare mega against some other specific companies and we can see for about the same amount of growth that you're going to get in the others now let's look at price to book and ROE the price to book of the company is at about 4.4 based upon the forecast numbers and that compares to about 7.3 uh, for the overall industry. So it's cheaper there. And when we look at the ROE, it's slightly less at 15.6 versus the industry's 18.1. So somewhat justified to have a lower uh, price to book. But you could argue that the industry is, is pretty expensive. But it's not just in Thailand. It's around the world where we can see that the P.E. to growth uh, ratio is, is a little bit high. But also for healthcare that we can see is that in Asia x Japan, it's ranked at about 3.7 for PE price to book ratio. Now let's move on and look at the sensitivity analysis. And this we look at what if sales growth changed by X percent, in this case, let's say increased by 10%, what would happen to EPS growth? It would go from 14 to 15. So very little change in margin and in ROE but a, a higher change in the EPS growth, right? And we can see very little change if we were to reduce that. If we were to look at the impact on value, we could see that the value would go up to 9.4 for dividend discount model in such a case. And if we look at the value based upon peg ratio, it would go up to 19.8 versus 18.2. Now, what if gross margin changed by, let's say, in this case, plus five percentage points? So that would go up to... 47 and that would have a major impact you can see right here that's a big increase and it would have a major impact on growth if it fell to right to 37 what we would see is that it would really stifle the growth and the value in the company would grow dramatically or it would collapse depending on which one of those so we can see that gross margin is very very sensitive uh, what about discount rate well discount rate doesn't have anything to do with fundamental factors and therefore we don't have any data in here. The discount rate has to do with the discounted uh, valuation model. So we don't have any information over here in the multiple section. And what we can see is that if the discount rate was to increase, meaning the riskiness assessment is higher, the value would fall from 8.7 to 7.7 .7 if it went up by 10, uh, by 10 points. And then it would rise to 9.8 if it fell. And then finally, if we say, what if terminal growth changed? Well, terminal growth will have a higher impact generally on the 
uh, free cash flow methods because there was more terminal, more value of the company was in the terminal value. So this gives you an idea of how to look at a valuation. It's an academic exercise and an example. I hope you learn from that.